Wherever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here at King's Chapel. Believer or doubter, seeker or skeptic, we're all on this journey together. Jesus said to his friends, my peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you, not as the world gives peace. Do not let your hearts be troubled, do not let them be afraid. In the ancient tradition of the church, let us share a sign of God's peace with one another and then rise and join in our opening hymn. God's peace be with you. God's peace be with you. God's peace be with you.
humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare thou those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Hear these words of God's promise. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all iniquity. Therefore, let us take heart. God will have mercy upon us, being penitent, Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness. And bring us to everlasting life. Now, as Christ has taught us, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips and our mouths shall show forth thy praise. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. Be honor and glory through Jesus Christ forever and ever. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. for this day is Psalm 118, verses 1 and 2, and 19 through 29. We'll read the psalm responsively. In this psalm, we'll hear about the Hosannas, those saying, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Let us read the psalm together. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for God is good. God's mercy endureth forever. 
Let Israel now say, God's mercy endureth forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may go into them with praise. Praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me, and art become my salvation. The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech thee, sin now prosperity. Blessed is the one that cometh in the name of the Lord. We bless you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, who hath given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. Thou art my God, and I will praise thee. Thou art my God, and I will exalt thee. O give thanks unto the Lord, for God is good, for God's mercy endureth forever.
The Gospel lesson appointed for this day is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. When Jesus and the disciples were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and we'll send it back here immediately. The two disciples went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them that Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heavens. Then Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Here ends the lesson. Let us pray. Well, God, as we hear these words again today, help us understand how you would have us hear them. Because we want to follow you. Amen. Palm Sunday again. Is this the first time any of you have ever experienced Palm Sunday? Wonderful. Then you're going to be our test case. How do you like that? Which is this. If you have never been to Palm Sunday and didn't know how the story ended, how would you greet today? What would you think? I'm going to ask you to pretend that you are back in Jerusalem all those years ago, and down the street you hear a commotion. There seem to be people there and something's going on and you don't know what, and so you're curious and you go there. What would you think is happening? One difference between the people of that time and our time is that we do not always pick up all of the scriptural references with the same clarity. But as I learned when I went to Transylvania this past summer to visit the first Unitarian church in all of the world, they are now in what is Romania. Originally, they were in hung Hungary, but with the wars, the borders changed, and now they are a little enclave in Romania. But they're Hungarian Unitarian. And so you know what happens? All the more they double down on what their rituals are, on attending church because it's the place they speak Hungarian, on being with others who share their same sense of history. It's cultural as well as religious, and they know their traditions well. The same would have been true at this time. 
Jews in Jerusalem would have been, uh, had been conquered by Rome, but they clung to what their tradition was and knew very well the scriptures, perhaps better than we today. So as if you were standing there in the city and you sort of saw this commotion happening, there would be pieces of the puzzle that might start coming together. The first big story, of course, for the Jewish people is that of the Exodus, because imagine being completely downtrodden, completely enslaved, not in your home country, and a leader is sent, Moses. It's a long journey back, but it is a journey of, that we call Exodus, and it's the journey of returning home to be the people they had always intended to be, no longer enslaved. Of course, in the journey, they have to go through many things, and <clears throat> one tradition is this tradition your Jewish friends may engage in now, which is called Sukkot, where you set up a small little temporary home, and on top of it are branches, including the branches of palms. And you remember that once a year for a week because you know that there was a time when you were, had been in Egypt and were wandering in the desert and God was still there but it's branches that would surround you. And then, when the people did get to Jerusalem, they, there was a service where they would walk around the altar with palms, rejoicing, <laughs> and remembering how God had saved them in the Exodus. Another big story, of course, came um, <clears throat> with King David. They had been scattered tribes. They had not all had uh, been uh, even successful when they got back to the promised land. There were people there already. But through King David, there was a conquest, and the people slowly but surely took over the whole land, and all the 12 tribes of Israel were united. David, their king, strong, a warrior, and he was the one who people felt uh, was also another model of who might come and rescue them now. The third big story uh, is, of course, exile and return. This happened later. The people had already been back in Jerusalem. The heyday of David had taken place and was long gone. Now they were a small place broken up into different tribes, and they were taken by the Babylonians um, back to Babylonia. They were exiled. They were far from their home again. But the end of that story, once more, it's called Exile and Return, is that they were brought back to Jerusalem, where they began to build a new temple. Three major stories in the life of the Jewish people. The Exodus, including Sukkot, and of course Passover, Passover the people were there to celebrate that weekend in Jerusalem an expectation that God would be with them again, that God was a rescuer, someone who could bring them out of the deepest pits. Then there was the God of yeah, you know, glory, King David, conqueror, able to take care of all of your problems through might and right. And then there was the exile and return, a great defeat, being taken off to a foreign country, but then coming back. God being present again. So many of the passages we read from Isaiah are about this. So you know this deep and well within you. And you've been under Roman rule for a while, and here you are thinking about Passover. You're all there to celebrate it in Jerusalem again, which you know, reminds you of that wonderful time when you were saved. And down the block, there are people making a bit of a ruckus, so you go to see what it's all about. And here's this odd scene. Not David on a great war horse, but rather this man on the colt of a donkey. Some people wonder if his legs, in fact, touched the ground. I mean, this was a small donkey. It was not a symbol of you know, great strength and might. On the other side of town, by the way, that's what Pilate would have been displaying because Pilate was a Roman governor and he had to come into Jerusalem at the time of the Palm Sun, at the time of the Passover. He had to make sure everything was kept you know, under wraps because what if these Jewish people got the idea at Passover again that they could be liberated? So in he marched with a great show of force, awe. What do we call that in the Iraqi war? Something in awe. 
shock and awe. That's Pilate. Coming in, shock and awe. He, he, he's on his big horse. Others are marching in. There are spears. But not this, this other thing that's happening where you are. There seems to be someone humble and on a donkey. And remember a verse that says, you know, your king will come back humble and on a donkey to bring peace to all nations. And where is the path he's coming from? He's coming down the Mount of Olives. Oh, that's where the returning Messiah is supposed to come, right down that path on a donkey. Hmm. And then there are people starting to shout. And what are they shouting? Words right from that psalm we just read. That was a song people used to say as they went up to Jerusalem in, in excitement to be there near their temple. Hosanna, save us now. Come to us, O oh God. And people start shouting that. They become part of these stories that are in the Bible. And they start enacting them again as if, as if they could happen again as if an exodus could happen again, as if an exile and return had happened again. This is what they were living for. For a king, they would throw down their cloaks upon the ground. And for the people who were uh, Zechariah, he would say, we're going to wave palms, as we did um, related to Zuccot. Which is it? There are all these stories, there are all these puzzle pieces. How are people going to put it together? And at the beginning, what they think is that this might be the guy. This might be the Messiah. Yes, a new king, but, but not a conquering king, a, a humble king. Well, or was that true? Because could a king really be humble if you're going to overtake the Romans? Yes, Jesus talked about healing and forgiveness, and, but if you're going to overtake the Romans, how did they put the pieces together of God's promise to them? What would be your deepest longings if someone was coming? And on our day, it likely wouldn't be down the street, but think of if you knew someone was coming and you wanted to go see what it was all about. Someone who you think might be able to help with the thing you most want. What might that be? People were thinking about what they most wanted, and I'm sure there was a desire for freedom from the Romans. I'm sure there was a desire for some economic security. They were under the thumb. They had all these taxes they had to pay. How were they going to feed their kids? I'm sure they wanted more freedom to speak out and be who they really were, because you know, you got in a lot of trouble if you spoke out. In those days, you might end up on a cross, what was it they most yearned for? Maybe it was for a new little baby that had been born to know a different life when, when she grew older. So with all of those hopes that we have and that they had, this man comes on a donkey. And there's excitement and people are waving the palms. That's why I did not want you to just have one little, little scrawny palm. I told the children this morning that adults usually took one strand and went like this. And I said, kids, we have to show them the right way, the exciting way, and I had them take bunches of palms. Did they show you the joy that people could have felt? The joy that if we weren't always so human and not aware of all the things that are impossible, we might, we might have felt at that time that there might be an answer to your deepest yearnings, and it might have to do with this one named Jesus. As the week wore on, of course, the vast majority of people concluded this man was yet another disappointment, another fraud, because he was not going to be David, and he was not going to overthrow the powers, and they were still going to be stuck under Rome's rule, and there was still Pilate. In fact, Pilate had all the power who had put the guy to death. But a few people, I bet, a few here and there, had caught a glimpse of something. It said, what if there were power 
in the love that gets preached and the healing way that goes to everybody, not just some people? What if there were the power you could kind of imagine what would happen if everyone came together and said, we want to help one another. So if your child needs food, you know, we can share. Like back in those days when the, all the crowds sat there together and there wasn't enough to share and it was a child, like our children this morning, who said, oh, I have, I have these two fish and these, lo these loaves. And Jesus took them and broke them up and all were fed. The child didn't know to give up hope. And maybe others took out from their secret stash what they'd been storing and shared because the children lead them. Could it be that there's a different way of living, even though we're all practiced at knowing disappointment? In 2003, just before Palm Sunday, America did go in with a shock and awe into Iraq. And right before that Sunday, we all saw that picture of our soldiers pulling over the statue of Saddam Hussein. Remember? Shock and awe. We were there, we were triumphant. And then we read this passage, triumphant, someone coming to save the people of Iraq. And we know how that worked out, don't we? Do we ever remember how the violent ways work in the end? Some people may have remembered, and they may have gotten a glimpse and said, well, why not now? Why don't we just start now? Could it be, what if a few of us gathered together, could the world be different? There is a quote from Reinhold Niebuhr, I'm looking for it. I didn't have it at the nine o'clock service and it appears I don't have it now either. How can that be? It's one of those wonderful quotes that says, nothing worth doing can be done in a lifetime. Nothing worth doing, the really important things, because the things that are easy would have already been done, but nothing worth doing can be done in a lifetime. Therefore, we have to be saved by hope seems hopeless, but, but we have to trust in that hope to go forward for anything really worth doing. Nothing worth doing can be done alone. Therefore, we must be saved by love. We have to come together with other people. And nothing worth doing is quite as virtuous in our own eyes as it might be in the eyes of all. Therefore, we have to be saved by forgiveness humility, but coming together with others, even though it seems hopeless, what would that be like for you in your life, for our country in our life? What would it be that you would hope for, and might you find it this week and always? I pray you will.
Please be seated. Let us say together the Collect for Grace. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that in all our doings may be ordered by thy governance to do always that which is righteous in thy sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, in whose hands are all the nations of the earth, and from whom all thoughts of love and peace proceed, kindle in the hearts of all thy people the love of peace. Guide those who govern the nations, that in all of their deliberations they may be enabled to secure the peace, liberty, and safety of all thy people throughout all generations. This we humbly ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, from whom cometh every good and perfect gift, send down upon all ministers of the gospel and upon the congregations committed to their charge the healthful spirit of thy grace, and that they may truly please thee, pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing. Grant this, O Heavenly Father, for thine infinite mercy's sake, in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O God, the creator and preserver of all humankind, we humbly beseech thee for all sorts and conditions of thy people, that thou wouldst be pleased to make thy ways known unto them, thy saving health unto all nations. More especially, we pray for the good estate of thy holy church, that it may be so guided and governed by thy good spirit that all who profess and call themselves Christians and all those who seek thee, be, thee by any other name may be led into the way of truth and hold the faith in unity of spirit, in the bond of peace, and in righteousness of life. Finally, we commend to thy goodness all those who are in any way afflicted or distressed in mind, body, or estate, and especially thy servants, Billy Barthorpe, Ellen Christensen, Richard Dorlando, Sil Sylvia Soderberg, Cindy Cord Wellington, Madeline Wilson, Russ Miller, Wadad Ayad, C.L. Hills, Lee Glenn, Earl Holt, Martin Kearns, Daniel Worth, Trevor Pennock, Carl Henning, and those whom we hold up to thee in silent prayer. May it please thee to comfort and relieve them according to their several necessities, giving them patience under their sufferings and a happy issue out of all of their afflictions. And this we humbly ask as disciples of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, thou end and thou beginning of all journeys, we offer humble thanks and hearty praises for all thy saints who have found their journey's end in thee. And on this day, we remember especially thy servant whose service we held here yesterday, Meredith Clapp. This prayer we make through him who promised us eternal life, even Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us say together the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, thine unworthy servants, do give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all people. We bless thee for our creation, 
preservation in all the blessings of this life, but above all, for thine inestimable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful, and that we may show forth thy praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to thy service, and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we ascribe unto thee all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, and hast promised by thy beloved Son that where two or three are gathered together in his name, thou, O God, wilt be in their midst. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. We came with palms this morning, and the word that came to our lips was Hosanna, which is a word of praise to God. And it also translates, save now. The work of this church, we try to have be both praise of God and a saving presence in some way in your lives or the lives of the city. As you are able, please join us in that commitment financially. Our gifts will now be given and received.
I've been here uh, 11 years, and I arrived the day after Palm Sunday. I really wanted to spend Holy Week with you. I told Dean Denniston, who is then our senior warden, that I planned to um, encourage, although I might have said people should, come to all the services during Holy Week. And Dean already kind of getting a sense of who I was. Be, oh, no, 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 I don't say they should come to the services. The people of King's Chapel will not like you to be directive. True. I said, what I mean is an invitation. In my own life, what I've discovered is the more I participate in the services of this week, the deeper my own spiritual journey goes and the much deeper appreciation I have for the message of Easter. So I invite you. We have a plentitude of wonderful services this week. On Thursday, we remember the Last Supper that Jesus had with his friends, and we wash one another's feet, if you're willing to have that be done. You get down on your knees yourself and you wash another's feet, and then that person washes the next person, and on we go. You are washed, they are washed, and we are a community. We also serve communion, of course. And then when the evening ends, uh, we take all the things that are beautiful on this altar and on this communion table and we carry them out because the night has fallen and Jesus will not be coming back to this table, not right away. The next day on Friday at 12.15, we have a noon service here. Steve Courtney is going to help us by reading the long passage that's the Passion Passage. And then when we get together at night, there are two special services that Heinrich has taught me about um, that this church offers, full of music and light and darkness. The Friday night service is called Tenebrae, and the church begins with lights, and then slowly but surely as we read the story of Jesus' crucifixion and his betrayal and then his death, lights are put out. And at the very end, there'll be only one light left here, and it's carried out and disappears. Because who knows if the light will ever be seen again. On Saturday, we have the Holy Easter Vigil, and it really becomes the Easter celebration. But it starts in darkness, and then slowly but surely, we, we light the lights, and there's this extraordinary scene the choir does, and the light comes back in. And from that one light, all the others in the church are lit. And you say, ah, oh, light. That light is something I want in my life, too. And then there's the joyous celebration of Easter on Sunday morning. It will be two services at 9 in our little chapel and at 11 here. As much as you're able, you're invited. They'll also be live streamed if that works better for you or be on our YouTube site. But your choir has put together remarkable services throughout this week, and please know that you are welcome to be with us if you're able. The second announcement is fabulous. It is the announcement about the concert tonight at 5 p.m. Uh, box Mass in B minor will be performed here as the grand finale of a whole season of concert that, that Heinrich and our choir has had. There'll be song, there will be orchestration, and together we will participate and hear this beautiful entire mass. The sur that concert will be about two hours long. There'll be an intermission in the middle. It's being offered by Suzette Schockett in honor of her husband, they met coming to a concert here at King's Chapel on their first day. Please come and be with us for that. It will be an extraordinary experience, I promise you. And now, let us return to our worship and sing words of joy.
Dear friends, look at the children of our church. They come and sing joyfully. They have hopes and they have expectations of a life that will be full, full of love. And we want to give that to them, not only in this congregation, but throughout the world. Join us in trying to make that happen. Amen. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.